The major amendments to the Clean Air Act, which made it a substantial act that had governing and um, regulation authority, were passed in 1970. And we will discuss in this talk some of the events that led up to the establishment of this act and the establishment of the EPA, which is the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States. So um, leading up to this, so in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, there was a lot, all of a sudden there was a much more awareness of the fact that the environment was in crisis as a result of industrialization. One example of this is the Cuyahoga River in Ohio. So in November of 1952, there were was, was so many contaminants, so very high levels of contaminants due to industrial pollution that the, the river burst into flames and some say it was on its, own, on its own. I have a feeling there was a spark involved, but and anyways, there was enough stuff floating on top of the water that the river itself burst into flames. Uh, additionally, there was a lot more awareness at this time that water supplies in general were deteriorating. People were noticing that their rivers were not as clean, lakes were not clean, and water supplies were also deteriorating for drinking. Um, in 1962, Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, came out, which discussed the hazards of pesticides and how they harmed ecosystems and eventually also human health. And then finally, people started to notice that public areas were being used to dump waste. So it was not illegal to dump waste onto the surface of soils, and in fact, that's how many um, industries would get rid of their liquid waste, just dump it on the soil. Additionally, there wasn't the regulations that we have today about where you can dispose of solid waste, and so people would leave drums of hazardous chemicals. They could leave just general garbage around, tires, and so um, public areas were starting to become um, fairly polluted with solid and liquid wastes. In January and February of 1969, there was a major oil spill in California. This oil spill was the largest at the time in U.S. history, and it's still actually the third largest oil spill in U.S. history. And that's after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, and then of course the Exxon Valdez spill in Alaska. So this is the third largest after those two spills. This spill um, killed more than 3,500 birds. It killed also many mammals, including dolphins, sea lions, elephant seals. And at this time, people were watching TV. They could see the damage caused by the spill. And um, our president at the time, President Nixon, went out and saw the impacts of the spill firsthand. And this is important because Richard Nixon was instrumental in getting the EPA established and the Clean Air Act um, strengthened and passed. Uh, California has not granted a new oil drill lease since this oil spill in 1969. So there is still some, some offshore, not drilling, but um, well, there's still offshore drilling going on and there's offshore development, but those are from old existing leases. So they are not, they are not allowing new oil drill leases. If we want to look at air pollution in particular, since we are talking about the Clean Air Act, there's a number of different incidents that happened that brought attention to the plight of the atmosphere and, and atmospheric pollution. In October of 1948, 20 people were killed and many more were made ill um, in Donora, Pennsylvania by an air pollution cloud. Then in 1952 in London, so not in the United States, but still our neighbor and our uh, ally, over 3,000 people were killed by what was called a killer fog in, in the city of London. Uh, just one year later, in 1953, about 230 people died and, uh, in a six-day smog event. Um, it was over the Thanksgiving weekend, and many more people were made ill. There was debate about the number of people. They had to go back and look up records because when, you, when, when people died at this during this week, often they didn't say air pollution. It was cited as, you know, um, they would have heart issues or... 
um, breathing issues, asthma, etc. So they had to go back and comb through, and that's why the numbers are are approximate. So then, because of all of these events that were that were happening, and people were becoming much more aware of the impacts of pollution on their environment. Uh, in 1963, that was what, when the first Clean Air Act was passed. This act was simply enacted to provide funds so that the government could study and improve air quality. In 1970, that's when major Clean Air Act amendments were put in place that allowed for enforcement authority so that the government could enforce um, air quality uh, regulations so they could go they could come along and say you can't put more than this amount of a certain pollutant into the air at a given you know in a given space and at a given rate um, they also established a list of criteria pollutants that they would they would regulate uh, the same year the Environmental Protection Agency was established by Congress and President Nixon and this is important because they're the ones that are regulating these pollutants and ensuring that that people are following the regulations. Um, in 1990 the Clean Air Act was further amended and strengthened and this, these amendments some of the things they did they controlled for acid rain so they provided more stringent um, regulations on things like sulfur dioxide which leads to acid rain and they called for the protection of stratospheric ozone layer so that was um, chlorofluorocarbons that used to be very very commonly used as refrigerants that would go up into the stratosphere and it would degrade the ozone layer and this is one success story of regulations because we have since gotten rid of the use of all of those and our our ozone layer is no longer being deteriorated very well it, there's probably still some up there and they're probably still doing a little bit of damage but we're not adding to that damage and it's um, by all accounts it has improved since 1990.